It is on this morning that we must pour one out for our friends in the deep state. Joe Biden has broken with Israel, saying that Netanyahu is making a mistake and calling for a ceasefire. Well, this naturally has many people pissed off. And I can only imagine that many of our deep state military industrial complex cohorts are very upset on this day, realizing they've been running this shadow campaign to try and help Joe Biden win in November. And Joe Biden just said, look, I ain't going to win unless I say no to Israel because of Dearborn, Michigan, because of Minnesota and because of Gen Z breaking from the Democratic Party. Oh, poor deep state. They're now having their meetings where they're like, guys, if we want to keep the Israel campaign up, we're going to have to support Donald Trump. Ay, ay, ay. So pick your war, I guess. Donald Trump is more likely to support Israel, though not as much as the military industrial complex would want. Trump himself has been critical of Israel. But in this war, he's saying they're losing the PR battle, which is very different from calling for a ceasefire. That being said, when it comes to Ukraine, Donald Trump's like, we are ending it and we're not getting involved. So pick your poison. If you want the war in Ukraine to continue, vote blue. If you want the war in Israel to continue, vote red. To be fair, Donald Trump likely would still pressure Israel to change their tactics. And so I don't think it's fair to say that the war would necessarily continue in the same in the same fashion. But under Joe Biden, he is now actively calling for a ceasefire. Now, I don't think anyone literally wants war to continue. I'm joking. But there are a lot of people who are making these arguments. We have a tweet from Ben Shapiro talking about what's going on in Ukraine and in Israel. And asking the question, what do you want? If you don't want to fund these wars, what do you want to happen? Do you want Russia to just take over Hamas to just keep attacking civilians? Well, I will answer that question as I think I think it's actually a legitimate question. I really do. And we can talk about America first versus, I don't know, American international exceptionalism or whatever you want to call it. But this is big. Biden realizing he can't win an election. I'm kidding about all the deep state stuff, by the way. Biden realizing he can't win an election without the youth vote, he's already suffering in the polls, is now trying to play both sides, saying, you know, maybe we need a ceasefire. Critics are saying, yo, Hamas still has hostages. There's there's American citizens who are being held hostage. So what do you do? Now, most of you know, I take a more America first stance in that I'm just like face palming like... I guess under the argument, there's an, there's there's uh, American citizens who are being held hostage. I believe they're dual citizens. I don't think that matters all that much, but there, I, I do think it's important to point that out. And we can talk about that, too. I think there's still some obligation to get the hostages back. And there's very serious. It's a very serious conundrum pertaining to how we handle an international conflict like, like this. I don't think the United States should be involved in these foreign affairs the way they are. I believe America should mind its own business and not be the world police. But, well, the reality of things is that the United States has been the world police for a long time. And now we have to deal with the ramifications of that. What that means is in an ideal scenario, NATO pays their fair share. We negotiate treaties and peace agreements. We set up security that doesn't involve us deploying our militaries, meaning it's going to have to be you know, in in these regions, certain uh, treaties, they're going to have to run their own security, but it's going to be set up in a way that you don't let the Taliban like just take over. Okay, I I don't want to get into too much before I read the news, but we will talk about it. Here's a story from The Guardian. They report U.S. President Joe Biden has said Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's approach to God on Gaza was a mistake and urged Israel to call for a ceasefire in an interview that aired on Tuesday. Biden's comments were some of his his strongest criticism yet of Netanyahu amid growing tensions over the civilian death toll from Israel's war on Hamas and dire conditions inside Gaza. Quote, I don't think I'm sorry. He says, quote, I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. Biden told Univision, Spanish language TV network, when asked about Netanyahu's handling of the war. Biden reiterated that an Israeli drone attack last week that killed seven aid workers from a U.S. based charity in Gaza and sparked a tense phone call with Netanyahu was outrageous. Now, I'd like to pause and say uh, there were three different vehicles in three different places. So it may have been one drone or whatever, but uh, certainly these aid workers were targeted. Quote, what I'm calling for is the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks, total access to all food and medicine, 
going into the country. And there are hostages. There are no easy answers in war. Okay. And this is what really frustrates me about the, the very absolutist positions you end up getting. I, I can respect there's no easy answers. Absolutely. There are some people who are like, why don't you just have a ceasefire? There's no such thing. There is no such thing as a ceasefire. Let me, let me, let me just, let me just uh, calm everybody down for a second. These leftists are demanding a ceasefire. What they're actually saying is Israel stop firing back because Hamas, there's no ceasefire with Hamas. They'll break it in two seconds. So what they're really saying is Israel stop striking Gaza. And that's fine if that's what you want. Say it. But there is nothing. Biden saying we need a ceasefire. He's basically saying Israel, hold your fire. Hamas will then start attacking you. They will use the, the, the time and resources to build up their forces. Sorry, I'm not advocating Israel do anything. I'm telling you a fact. Or I should say a little hyperbolic. I'm telling you the most likely scenario. Israel halts. Hamas builds up. It's called war. There is no magical Skittles and rainbow world where Hamas and Israel go, why are we even fighting anymore? I don't know. Let's just be friends. Israel stops. Hamas starts. It just doesn't end. It's called war. That's the problem. This is what war is. This is why I like Donald Trump and the Abraham Accords. Now, Dave Smith, of course, says the Abraham Accords paved the way for this conflict because it put pressure on Hamas to act because they were being sidelined. I don't think that's a good enough reason to just say the Abraham Accords were bad. Normalizing uh, economics between countries that are hostile is the first major step towards peace. And I don't know what else you do. Do you simply say, well, there's a rogue faction of terrorists who will get really angry if we have a peace deal. So just don't have the peace deal. I don't think you can do that. But I, but I, I can respect absolutely that Dave is well informed on the issue and we may disagree on, on the issues, but at least he knows what he's talking about. I just think, you know, we, we have to have, have a conversation about what will happen. And I know we disagree on that one. The president's remarks on a ceasefire marked a shift from his previous comments in which he said the burden lay with Hamas to agree to a truce and hostage release deal. Now, why isn't it that, you know, with with Israel bombarding Gaza, why isn't why why, why didn't Biden say Hamas needs to surrender? Why, why, why is it Israel needs to stop striking? Hamas still has hostages. I'm not saying I'm morally supporting either side. I'm saying, understand, this is an important context in this. You've got two warring factions. In fact, the recent conflict that we're dealing with is started by Hamas, not by Israel. People then come out and say, but Israel funded Hamas. That may be. But right now, the active conflict is because of October 7th. Hamas could surrender, but they're not going to do that. Biden also stepped up pressure on Israel to let more aid in, in, into devastated Gaza, saying he'd spoken to Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Egypt, and they were prepared to move this food in. So use the Rafah crossing. Egypt has a border with Gaza as well. There's no excuse to not provide for the medical and food needs of those people. It should be done now. Israel said 468 aid trucks moved into Gaza on Tuesday after 419 entered on Monday, the highest numbers in six months since the conflict began. However, the UN said it was still much less than the bare minimum to meet humanitarian needs. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Biden urges Israel to just call for a six to eight week ceasefire. All right, there we go. There we go. This is where we're going. Huh? Israel threatens powerful response in Iran's territory if it attacks from its own soil. There's no good answers here. We are facing down the barrel of World War Three. Don't take my word for it. Theweek.com says, are we heading towards World War Three? Because it's not just Putin. It's not just North Korea. It's not just China. It's Iran. So what do you do? Iran's basically threatening Israel. But this is. It's all excuses. None of these countries like Israel. They don't want Israel to exist. They do not want the establishment of a Jewish state. All this, uh, you know, look, it, it really is just that simple. Then you get Iran finding excuses. So they help supply weapons to various militias in the Middle East, as well as Hamas. And then when Israel retaliates, Iran says, oh, no, you, look what you've done. Welcome to war, my friends. The, idea, the, the naive idea, these protesters the other day in the uh, Senate cafeteria got arrested, saying like, no one eats until there's a ceasefire or whatever chant they had. These people live in Wally world. 
They, they, they really, really do. They don't understand that in war, there's no simple, we stop fighting. Let's take a look at the Civil War. We talked about it last night because yesterday was the anniversary of the Confederate surrender at Appomattox. And uh, I love the urban legends. Apparently, Grant says, ah, it's all romantic. They sat down. They said, OK, if you guys surrender, we won't prosecute you. And you can keep your mounts and your weapons. Just stop fighting. And uh, Lee was like, OK, because they were losing. And he's like, he knew they, he knew they were going to lose. And so he just said, fine, no prosecutions. We'll call it a day. These were people who had fought together, trained together and shared their ideals. Except for, well, not not necessarily slavery. I know everybody says like the issue of slavery. And that's not why Grant and Lee were having a meeting. Maryland, uh, I believe Delaware, they were still slave states in the United States. But the issue was that these were guys who had trained at the same places, who shared most of their worldview. And so they said, we can stop fighting. You will lose on this one. Now, imagine you have two guys who don't speak the same language, who believe in different gods. You know, we were reading that story the other day. And I said, I don't think that could happen today. We got that Civil War movie coming out tomorrow, the A24 Civil War movie. Andy No and Taylor Hansen. Shout out. They've got footage in the film, I hear. And if there were to be a civil war today, it would be more like, I don't think it would be exactly like Israel and, and Palestine. It'd be more like that than the American Civil War in, the 18, in 1861. You basically have a bunch of sovereign states. They don't really view each other as the same places. They view themselves as part of a union, right? Right now, if you're from Virginia or Texas, you're still American. Back then, yeah, but you were a Texan or you were a Virginian. After the Civil War, that all changed. So you had people who disagreed on the strength of the union. And one side said, we're going to form our own. We're going to break, we're going to break away and we're going to create a confederacy. And slavery was an underlying principle of the confederacy. It was like it was in their, their founding documents. And the union just said, we don't care about none of that. You ain't leaving because we're one nation. They agreed on most things. Today, you're not going to convince a Trump supporter who's in an active conflict with the far left. They're, they're not going to agree. Far left is going to come out and advocate for weird sex stuff with kids because they're, they're, they're creepy pedos. They want to bring, they want to bring this sex stuff into schools. Cre like, I, I'm, I, you're just, there's an impasse. You get a guy, two guys who both trained at West Point and they're like, family, faith, religion. Well, we agree. I just think I should run my own government. No, you're a part of the union. They agree on most things. They can live with each other. And even then they were shooting at each other in one of the most bl bloody battles the world's ever seen. But it ended. What do you think is going to happen when you have the far left and the right in this country? I don't see that being a possibility. Now, as for Israel and Palestine, it's, it's basically what it is. Opposing worldviews with no reconciliation. They, 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 they do not grow up in the same way. They do not believe in the same things. They do not like each other. And they don't want. I mean, I, I'll say this. Israel is not, you know, targeting and blowing up all these Middle Eastern countries. They're mostly minding their own business and getting attacked. And the argument from the people who don't like Israel is that Israel should not exist. And they say that if you believe Israel has a right to defend itself, you're a Zionist. Yo, know, I wasn't alive during, when the Balfour Declaration happened. Israel is a place with people and, a, and there's people there. I ain't know nothing about nothing. OK. Call it Zionism because I don't want it because I'm like, well, they're a country. They have people. They call that Zion. That's insane. Ben Shapiro brings up an interesting point. Ben Shapiro roasts Marjorie Taylor Greene and Republican clowns for threatening Mike Johnson and holding GOP hostage over Ukraine. Really? So Ben Shapiro tweets this. Let's uh, grab this tweet. He says, so much of our politics is about deliberately ignoring the underlying question. For those who want a ceasefire in Gaza. The underlying question is, do you want Hamas to survive as an operational entity? For those who want defunding of Ukraine, the underlying question is, do you want Russia to ingest Ukraine? Uh, I'll answer this. I don't care about a ceasefire in Gaza at all. There's a clip. Coleman Hughes talking to Joe Rogan makes a really interesting point. He said that Hamas has perfected the blending of civilian population 
and uh, and military. So Israel, of course, when they want to attack Hamas, there's no urban distinction between who's Hamas and who's civilian for the most part. They can certainly get intelligence, target leaders and make surgical cuts, but civilians will die in the process because it is urban civilian population centers that also have Hamas out bases. Hamas operates a military base under hospital, schools, media centers intentionally. They want to create a scenario. It's a it's a modern warfare tactic because of our delicate sensibilities when it comes to war that force your enemy to bomb civilians because they're actually targeting you and civilians get killed in the collateral damage. I'll tell you this about Israel, uh, Palestine. Don't know, don't care. It's not America. Have a nice day. So, Ben, I can't answer your question about uh, do you want Hamas to survive as an operational entity? But I can but I can go a little bit further. Uh, Hamas should not survive. These 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 are these are brutal, murderous individuals. And I firmly believe that the best future for the Palestinians is one where Hamas does not exist. If Hamas did not exist and the Palestinians were amicable to treaties and negotiations, the conflict would be over. The problem, it means acknowledging the establishment of a Jewish state. The Hamas charter literally called for killing Jews. It's not an exaggeration. It was a passage from the Hadith that says that there will there will not. What, what is it? The end will not come or peace will not come until the trees and the rocks yell. There are Jews hiding and to come and hunt them down or something like that. They took it out a few years ago, but it's not like anyone believes that worldview changed. Now, as for Russia, I would like to see Ukraine defunded. And the question Ben asked, do you want Russia to ingest Ukraine? Mm. I have a very complex and sophisticated answer for you, Ben, uh, with all due respect. I don't care. That's it. I don't know why I should care about Ukraine. I've been there several times. I know people from there. It is sad what is happening. The war is awful. They're conscripting women and older men. Terrible. And they don't want to be uh, they don't want their land taken by Russia. That sucks. There are a lot of countries in the world that have border disputes. The next thing you know, we're going to be getting into what a conflict over Kashmir. Am I supposed to be angry about that? Dude, I don't care. Am I supposed to be upset about Burma? I don't care. Look, I don't want to live in a world where we're spending all this money to go gallivanting around the planet because other people are fighting about things that have nothing to do with us. But that's the name of the game, I guess. Now, here's what I'll tell you. I'll cut you a deal. All right. I'll cut you a deal, deep state. You show me the aliens from the Galactic Federation who require a unified one world government in order for the for Earth to be admitted. And we can have a conversation about creating a one world government. If you know what I'm saying, the aliens are saying they got all this great technology. I'm kidding, by the way. My point is there is nothing available to us right now to justify any of this. Suppose fears of World War Three. Oh, no, if Russia takes Ukraine and then someone nukes somebody, it's like, dude. I, I, I don't see it. I don't see that path forward. What I see is. The Donbass region, Russia's fears that NATO is encroaching on its border, and it is Russia trying to secure its access to the Black Sea because it ships a lot of oil through the through the uh, Bosphorus, Turkey, into the Mediterranean. And. They, they, they don't want to lose access. It's that. There you go. They don't want to lose access. And they're willing to fight for it. The West is trying to admit Ukraine into NATO and the EU, pressing up against Russia's borders and telling Russia they have no say in how these things are run. Putin claimed that he met with Clinton and said that he wanted to join NATO. And Clinton said, yeah, actually, maybe you could. Then came back later and said, no, you can't. Why? Russia's too big. Russia joins NATO. They could actually start teaming up with other smaller countries. And then the United States loses its massive power control over the block. And that's where we are. For this, is it worth World War Three? Well, the joke I made is that were there a galactic federation of aliens, they certainly would not admit a warring planet. I mean, think about it this way. NATO wants to bring Ukraine into the fold, but Ukraine's in active conflict right now. So and, and with an outside force, imagine you have a state that's in total civil war. You can't. Who do you negotiate with? So I'm kidding once again about the galactic federation. 
I don't see a legitimate reason for any of their strategies or plans. Now, perhaps there is a world in which there is a unifying global authority of some sort that can adjudicate, but not enforce. And that would be more like a Supreme Court and less like an international policing body. My view of this is, how do we prevent war? Well, you can't because fighting happens. Gang territory happens. You unify the planet under one single governing authority and there will still be regional conflict. That's just it. Unless you shake up the world and homogenize it. Actually, no, I, I, I even then you will have conflict. There's nothing you can do about it. As people fight. Animals fight. Fighting happens. I think maybe there's a, there's a world in which there is an, an international uh, court of appeals or something. And instead of fighting and going to war, you go to court and the court will then issue a, a ruling that would require recognition of the court's authority. So I don't know how you get there, because what we don't want is an international policing body that can enter our borders and tell us what to do. Therein lies the big challenge, I guess. Well, the one thing I can say is it's really funny that right now, depending on who you pick, you're going to get different outcomes in foreign policy. Trump is certainly more pro-Israel. He's willing to say it. He's been critical, but not nearly and not, not near what Joe Biden just said with a ceasefire. Should be interesting. Should be interesting. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 1 p.m. on this channel. Thanks for hanging out and we'll see you all then.